The fellow that wrote that beautiful song you heard was named Roy Pendleton. Years ago, he came to the church after research into the inroads of spiritualism and created quite a stir as he exposed some of the plans that Satan was making in the occult world. He was a musician and one of our school teachers, and you can tell by that song where his heart was, can't you? He was ostracized by the denomination and blackwashed across the Americas, and the result was he became bitter and left for a time. He's an old man now, but he has a real experience with the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that in disappointment, he's watched year after year as the message was further and further taken away from our people and the world. <clears throat> but I think he can begin to look up again, don't you? The time's come. There's forces moving from beneath, and there's a force coming down from above to take possession of God's people. It's a wonderful day and age in which to live. The subject matter today is on eagle's wings. Jesus told the, the Israelites that he bore them on eagle wing, eagle's wings out of Egypt. And to you and I, we were born by eagle's wings into the wilderness. It's God's purpose in raising up the Seventh-day Adventist church to bring the church of the wilderness into the open for its final triumph. But unfortunately, in many ways, the church of God is still in the wilderness. I'd like to talk for a few moments about how I feel Christ is feeling at this time. This is a poem called Not One to Spare. Which shall it be? Which shall it be? I looked at John and John looked at me. Dear patient John who loves me yet as well as when my locks were jet. And when I found that I must speak, my voice seemed strangely low and weak. Tell me again what Robert said. And when I listened, bent my head, this is his letter. I will give a house and land while you shall live. If in return from out your seven, one child to me, for I is given. I looked at John. I looked at John's old garments worn. I thought of all that John had borne of poverty and work and care, which I, though willing, could not share. I thought of seven mouths to feed, of seven little children's need, and then of this. Come, John, said I. We'll choose among them as they lie asleep. So walking hand in hand, dear John and I surveyed our band. First to the cradle lightly crept, where Lillian, the baby, slept. A glory against the pillow white, softly the father stooped to lay his roughed hand down in gentle way. When dream or whisper made her stir, and huskily he said, Not her, not her. We stopped beside the trundle bed, and one long ray of lamplight shed athwart the boyish faces there. In sleep so pitiful and fair, I saw on Jamie's rough red cheek a tear undried. Ere John could speak, he's but a baby too, said I, and kissed him as we hastened by. Pale, patient, Robbie's angel face, still in his sleep, bore suffering's trace. No, for a thousand crowns, not him, he whispered while our eyes grew dim. Poor Dick, bad Dick, our wayward son, turbulent, reckless, idle one. Could he be spared? Nay. He who gave bade us befriend him to the grave. Only a mother's heart can be patient enough for such as he. And so, said John, I would not dare to send him from our bedside prayer. Then stole we softly up above and knelt by Mary, child of love. Perhaps for her it would better be, I said to John quite silently. He lifted up a curl that lay across her cheek in a willful way and shook his head. Nay. Love not thee, the while my heart beat audibly. Only one more, our eldest lad, trusty, truthful, good and glad, so like his father. No, John, no, I cannot, will not let him go. And afterward, toil lighter seemed, thinking of that of which we dreamed, happy in truth that not one face was missed from its accustomed place. 
thankful to work for all seven, trusting the rest to one in heaven. Think of our Savior going over the records in heaven, looking into the faces of his children on earth with a love greater than that of a parent and having to decide which to let go. He can't, like these parents, decide to keep them all. It's almost impossible to relate to the sorrow of our Savior. The Bible brings forth two groups and true church, two churches at the end of time. One is illustrated as Christ's beloved bride, a pure virgin. In the story of Songs of Solomon, there's a beautiful story that's laid out there. We learn about a, a young girl, black but calmly. She says, don't look at me. The sun has burned my skin. It's dark and wrinkled. And here in Palestine, you know, they don't like girls that are dark in skin. Her family was angry with her and made her to be a servant in their house. So she had no hopes of getting married, and there were many other daughters in the family ahead of her that had to be married first. No dowry and no hope, but she was a, an imaginative one. And she thought of that day when maybe she would be married. There was a lonely young man making his way through the woods one day, and as he came down over a hill and through a vineyard, he looked through the latticework of a fence, and there he saw a young girl quietly resting on the porch of a house. And he began a conversation with her. And as they talked and as they walked through the fields and picked flowers and looked at the trees as they waved in the afternoon breeze, there was something filled in each other's lives and they fell in love. He promised that he would return. But as the days went, she would wake up in the middle of the night hearing a knocking at the door and there'd be no one there. She began to tell about this fellow that she had met, but no one believed her. She began going door to door. Have you seen my love? He's about this big, a good-looking lad. Have you seen him? But they all knew who she was. They laughed at her. They scoffed at her. Finally, when she got to the gates of the city, the guards told her, go home and go back to work. She made her way sadly back to her house. But one day, that knock came again, and as she went to the door, here he was. And the dew was in his hair, and she grabbed him by the arm. You're not going to get away from me this time, she said. And so she took him down to the home of her parents, and there they were secretly wed. He said, I'm sorry, I have to go again, but I will return. I will come back. I love you dearly. And she saw him take off into the evening light. Then again, those countless nights, how many she didn't know whether they were days, whether they were weeks, months. Again, she went to the village, knocking on the doors. Have you seen this young man? I don't know where he came from, but I have to find him. She walked past the guards and out of the walls of the city. These rough men used to battle, grabbed her and beat her mercilessly. Get home and go back to work. She made her way back again, there to those grapevines, a work that had no joy for her now. And as a season came and went, she began to wonder whether it was true, whether he would ever come back, whether he was real or another figment of her imagination. And then one day she heard that the king was coming to her town. What was happening in, in Jerusalem was that the king, Solomon, was preparing to choose a bride. He had 60 men with... Uh, walking before his chariot. He made a beautiful chariot and put a veil around it that nobody could see in and only he could see out. The daughters of Jerusalem knew that he was going to pick a bride and they began to, to put on their, their nicest clothes and get all dressed up and the perfume and the hairstyles. It must have been just a, a tremendous array of the current fashions of Jerusalem. And as a chariot came out from the palace, the girls waiting on the streets to see if they would be the one that would be chosen. But he went right past the upper class district down through the middle class district and around and out through the poor classes and out of the city. These muscular men that were so proud to bounce along before the chair began to wonder, what's going on here? Pretty soon they went off the road. They went up through the woods and down looking out over a little vale where there was a little town. The people of that town became all excited. The king is coming. They could hear the noise of the crowd that was moving through the woods. She cried out to her relatives, to her, to her sisters, please, couldn't I go see the king too? They relented, and she, she made her way to the outskirts of the crowd that was forming there. The chariot moved into the crowd, and it stopped. 
Everyone became quiet. The veil began to open. There was a lonely man inside that. All the crowns and all the money in the world were of no joy to him because of an emptiness in his heart. And as he looked through the veil over that crowd, he saw a little face out on the outside of that crowd. He opened up the veil and he stepped down. He began to walk. The people parted and dropped to their knees. And as she saw the king coming, she dropped her knees too, face to the ground. In a few moments, there were two sandals right in front of her nose. And as she looked up those glorious robes underneath that crown, she saw the face of her husband. He had come back. He had come back. He picked her off the ground and carried her into the chariots. Once a poor slave bound by this world, now raised to the place of the queen in Jerusalem. This is God's church. He has promised to come back. He came to this world and betrothed us to himself through extreme suffering. And he's bound us to himself in cords that are never to be broken. And though through the years we have forgotten much, though through the years we wonder if it was true, and many times standing faithfully for the belief that he's coming back again, we have been beaten and torn and brutalized by the world. But standing firm, we wait. And one day while the rest of the world thinks that he's coming for them, he comes for that little group of people so brutalized and poor. And the entire world will see us raised up to heaven to rule with Christ upon his throne. This is God's church, but there's another church brought out, you know. A woman was grabbed mercilessly one day, torn from an adulterous relation. She was dragged through the dirt in the street in her, her vile condition and thrown down at the feet of Jesus. The onlookers looked at her scornfully. They said, stone her. Stone her. She was caught in the act of adultery. Stone her. Those of you who are without sin cast the first stone, and they began to walk away. And then as this poor wretched woman stood up before Jesus, trembling, thinking at any minute her life was to be taken, Jesus looked at her with no condemnation, with eyes of love. I don't condemn you. Go and sin no more. There are two churches in the world. One is an adulterer, and one is a church that's bound to Jesus Christ. And God wants at one time in history to have all those faithful within this adulterous church to come out. And one final bride awaiting him is com his coming. We have a choice as to which side we're going to be on right now. And there's not going to be any end of the strife until that glorious day. There is a strife between the forces of good and evil, between the loyal and disloyal angels. Christ and Satan are not at an agreement, and they never will be. In every age, the true church of God has engaged in decided warfare against satanic agencies. Until the controversy is ended, the struggle will go on between wicked angels and wicked men on the one side, and holy angels and the true believers on the other side. This is going on right now, whether we see it or not. And if we're asleep, it only means that we are being defeated by the enemy because the war is getting stronger and stronger out there. The most dangerous time in the war is when we don't see what's happening to us. I'd like to take you with me on a trip through Europe and give you a view of that precious church that God had raised up at the time of the apostles to call the people out of the apostate world. And I just, I just want you, as we go through this, to think of these as Seventh-day Adventists and nothing else as we go through this story. Could we have the lights out? <clears throat> There's one more light on over there in the middle. Okay. God raised up a church, a church to point to the world the truth. But they had apostatized against God by placing man in the place of God. God raised up one man, Daniel. And through Daniel, the truth of his church went to the entire world at that time. Again, he raised up the church at the time of the apostles. And this church was able to build upon the foundation of that early Jewish church that had been scattered throughout the world at the time of Daniel. It went through every country of the world 
in that time, the apostles could say that we have turned the world upside down, preached to every creature under heaven. The last of the apostles at 93 years old, John, was placed in a pot of boiling oil for his faith. All of his other companions had met terrible deaths, and now he believed this was his time. But this aged champion of God was placed on the Isle of Patmos. It was just a rock. It is just a rock. There's nothing much there. And there he wandered with the goats on this island, looking out over the sea that separated him from his beloved church at Ephesus. He had been a faithful soldier of God, bringing the light to Persia and to Parthia. And now he was a total exile. But there's a cave there on that island where he wrote the last message that God that came from the lips of Christ to this world. A message in this cave that's to go throughout the entire world and prepare the church for Christ's coming. Christians with Bibles in their hands made their way to every point of the globe. Within the next few hundred years, there were churches all the way from Japan on one side to Britain on the other. They went and they communicated with the people through the, on the streets, through the marketplaces, outside of the temples in Ethiopia, on the burning sands. They went up into the northern cold areas of Europe and Britain. They made their way through the vast mountains of the Alps and no place in the inhabited globe was there a place that was not touched. Even the Orient, even Scythia, even ancient China, all felt the movement of the gospel of God. Even the Hindu religion had to face it and created the apostate religion of Krishna as a counterfeit for apostolic Christianity. The world had been reached. These people believed in the soon coming of Jesus Christ and the keeping the Ten Commandments. The entire Christian world kept the Seventh-day Sabbath, and they were Seventh-day Adventists. The entire world was Seventh-day Adventists except Italy and Alexandria, Egypt, and there alone they kept Sunday. Through the centuries, they'd been persecuted relentlessly by the uh, pagans. Time here and time there, they were given religious freedom, and at those moments, the gospel spread with force. Because every Christian that accepted the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ believed that imbued with the Spirit, he had only one mission in life, and that was to further that gospel on earth and make sure that that Bible passed on to the next generation to prepare those for the coming of Jesus Christ. There on the cold northern islands of Ireland, in the, in the third and fourth century, Patrick, an apostle of God, was raised up. He had been a slave, and once he escaped, he established a college. And from that college, some of the most brilliant men in that age were educated. Princes and kings came there. And these princes went back to their countries with the knowledge of the Sabbath and the Ten Commandments. One of those who graduated from his college was a man by the name of Columba. Columba made his way to the northeastern coasts of Scotland. And there on this bleak island called Iona, he established an institution in the 6th century which continued for 625 years. And there again the nobility of northern Europe made their way to this little lonely island to get the highest form of education known to man in the world. These youth that came to that island had to study for 18 years. They learned Latin, Hebrew, and Greek. It was a work-study program. They had to earn their own living off of that island. And when they were sent out into Europe, they were excellent dialecticians and linguists. They could go into any country of Europe and build up another school just like it. Any individual that graduated from that school and begin to send other missionaries out. And nothing could stop the movement. Catholicism didn't have the power in these years to do that. Although she was persecuting in a local level, she couldn't stop this tremendous movement. The result is that in the British Isles, of the major uh, countries that, that uh, the Isles broke up into, the most prominent and the most powerful were Seventh-day Adventists. And their apostles were entering into the kingdom that the papacy was trying to build up and encouraging the Celtic church that had originated with the Galatians that Paul had uh, worked with. This is uh, buildings and castles in Scotland. When the papists first came to that isle, a man by the name of Augustine was sent, and when he confronted these early Britain Seventh-day Adventists, he could not confound them by scripture. He encouraged the pagans 
to work with the Roman Catholic Church and in time over the years. The early church was exterminated but kept rising up again and again. You cannot stop the Lord. We know that in 313 the persecution was stopped as Constantine came in. But then within a short time persecution resumed under the name of Christianity. There was an area in Europe that was protected for centuries from persecution. North of Rome was a place called Lombardy. And in this area, the primitive Christians from the time of the apostles had their own copies of the Bible. They were protected by the great bulwarks of the uh, Alps. Here in these Alpine valleys, these people separated from other uh, of the churches in the Europe. There were four major sections of the church. There was Assyrian, there was the Celtic, the Latin, and the Greek. And they all had their own Bibles. The whole world had access to the Bible. In these alpine passes very early, a man by the name of Vigilantus came through. And there he found a primitive apostolic church. It was about the time of Jerome. And here he, uh, he preached and he organized them. And through them, a tremendous missionary movement continued to move among the barbarians. It's hard for us to realize that, that Alphephus in the 4th century wrote the first book that the Goths ever had. He devised the written language for the Gothic people. And you know the first book that he wrote for them was? It was the Bible. The Goths were Seventh-day Adventists. The, the uh, Eastern Goths, the Western Goths, the Visigoths, and the Ostrogoths were Seventh-day Adventists as they moved out across the earth. They were part of God's church. But the most famous valley of all, and my favorite valley, I've been there four times, is this Vale of Torre, the Valley of uh, Torre Pilice. And here for centuries, the papal armies came in, and some of the most horrible massacres in those little valleys took place. About the 12th century, a man by the name of Waldo, there were many men named Waldo. The Waldenses were already known by Vadois and Waldensi at this time, so their name didn't originate from this man. But he found something in the Lord Jesus Christ. It was so different from the Roman Catholic Church that dominated his little town that he determined to give up his wealth and to spend the money for translating the Bible into the vernacular of the people. He, with this Bible in his hands and his followers, made their way under persecution into the Alps. And there they discovered the primitive apostolic church. From that time on, the Waldenses were all, just about all of the... Uh, the heretics, according to the Catholic Church, were named Waldenses. But there were many different groups that had risen up at that time. From the 14th century on, nothing was safe. Terrible persecutions took place. It was Innocent III in the 12th century that began the Inquisition. And from that time on, the papacy felt that they were free to kidnap women and children, send them off to monasteries and convents, or torture them to death. They sent men to hide in caves along the paths, and a family never knew whether their loved one would ever come back to them again. But this is the simple church of the Waldenses, far different than that of the Catholic Church. The Bible was the center of their religion. Their communion cup was passed around the entire church congregation in their communion. These people lived as the Bible as a foundation of everything for them. They reached the highest culture and the highest level of education of any peoples in Europe. Their children were trained to memorize large portions of scriptures. Actually, they organized little societies for the children, not at all like pathfinders. In fact, I don't know, I'll mention that in spiritualism where pathfinders came from. But uh, these little children would each memorize a portion of the Bible and then they would get the society together. And with these groups of societies, one to one, the children uh, reciting, they could memorize, the, they had the entire Bible. So that even if the Bibles were destroyed, immediately they could write the Bible again and go right on with it. Satan couldn't stop them. This is a, an old uh, Bible uh, at the time of the Reformation. And you can tell, unlike these beautiful preserved Bibles in the, uh, in the vaults of the Roman papacy that are hardly ever touched, this Bible was used. Looks like a piece of lettuce there. Education was paramount. They believed that their future of God's church resided in the minds of the children. And at times these children had to go and do their studies in caves. But even in the caves, the libraries of the Waldenses were vast. 
Their history was extensive. They went right back to the apostolic times. When the papacy came in, and especially under the Inquisition, it was under the control of the Jesuits in the 16th, 17th century, the main goal of the Roman Church was to destroy the literature of the Waldenses, the highest culture in Europe, and replace it with a monstrous uh, religion of Roman Catholicism. And thus, history was largely destroyed, and the spirit of prophecy tells us that true history is written in heaven. We have a little idea of what happened to these people, but I'd like to read you something. I know that this, uh, this is not a pretty scene, but we need to, to sometimes look at these things square in the face. Every frightful torture that could be invented by the depraved nature of Christ rejecting sinners was practiced or encouraged by the loathsome partakers of the holy sacrifice of the Mass. The monks, priests, bishops, archbishops, and archdeacons pouring boiling oil and tar on their victims, racking their bones out of joint, whipping the soles of their feet with rods, disemboweling them and leading them around by their intestines, running, women, running the women through with spears throughout their entire body, tightening chains on their heads till their eyes came out, planting firebrands on their breasts and the genitals of men, cutting in pieces women with scissors raking flesh with graters, grilling bodies on iron grills and eating them, putting the thumb screws on people, cutting off their tongues, cutting off their lips, nose, ears, fingers, toes, breaking their bones one at a time, putting gunpowder in their mouths and lighting it, blowing their heads, burying them alive, strapped into coffins and pulling needles and wires through their flesh. We have no idea what Seventh-day Adventists have had to go through to make it possible for you and I to enjoy this faith today. One man, a man I believe that stood out in the history I was reading above every other was a man named Calambanus. He was a Celt. He was a tall, powerful man, blonde and blue-eyed. He came from the Isles of Britain, educated in Columbus's school. In the 6th and 7th century, he was invited by the royalty of France. This man who, who only wore a coarse brown garment and had a staff and his Bible to keep him company was one of the most literate men in the world at that time. Recognized by the nobility of Europe, he made his way to France and there set up one school after another. As the papacy moved in, they tried to stop it, but finally he made his way to the almost inaccessible reaches of the Pra del Tor in, uh, uh, at the head of the Valley of Engragna, the Valley of Groans in the Croatian Alps. And there he established a school that for decades and decades sent out men who knew Greek and Latin and Hebrew and the vernaculars and languages of the countries and went out and continued to spread the Seventh-day Adventist message, the soon return of Jesus Christ and the Seventh-day Sabbath throughout every country of Europe. And the papacy could not stop this man. They would have done anything to destroy him. They would have done anything to pull him into the racks of the Inquisition, but they couldn't touch him because God has his hand over him. Finally, he died, an old man, a long life of service for the Lord, and they buried him beneath this building here, the College of the Barbs in the Waldenses. There is these young men come to this, one of the most renowned of all institutions in the old Protestant world. They find that the heart of the institution is the Bible. There these young men memorized. There they learned languages. There they did research. There they became some of the most intellectual men. And then when they went out into the institutions of the world, the papists were terrified of running into these men. They were terrified of running into these men. They were ignoramuses. This was before the Jesuits reached at such a height of knowledge and learning. The, the stupid Benedictine and Franciscan monks and Dominican friars that knew nothing, very, nothing at all about the Bible could not stand against these men. And as they, they spread literature out in these universities, many of the noble families were won to Christ. We do not realize it, but the most brilliant and noble families of Europe were Seventh-day Adventists. By the ninth century, the entire world worshipped on the Sabbath except for, for just isolated areas in Italy and Alexandria, Egypt. Why don't we have that history today? Where is it? 1944, 1945, this book was published by a man in our uh, institution who spoke eight languages fluently, many of them Eastern languages. He went through the vaults of the old monasteries and old ruins, and he pulled up documentation for a book called Truth Triumphant. It documents the entire thing. It was ordered, the plates were ordered destroyed by the conference under Leroy Froome. And it's been kept from our people all these years. You can get it from Leaves of Autumn, Truth Triumphant by Benjamin G. Wilkinson. 
Another book, Facts of Faith, was out for only one year, 1943. The little book, The Walden Seas, by Wiling, that has been a classic for our children to read for years, is now out of print at the order of Charles Utt, who died just a little while ago. Why has our own history been kept from us? Many of us think that we as a church only arose in 1844. No! God rose the church out of the wilderness in 1844 to purify and to call his beloved out of the fallen Babylonian churches. God's bride was being called to do her work and bring others into her. These Waldensian missionaries made their way, brilliant men, men they made their way through the, to the houses of the poor and the wealthy. Many of them were merchants. They would uh, read scripts of the Bible to these people who listened with eager ears. Many of them were ready to face the fire if necessary. The papacy tried in every way to stop it. They couldn't. These barbs and their, their, their students every year would meet and study and pray and counsel together about their work. The students would go for three years with a pastor in actual experience of soul winning before he could ever be considered for ordination. And that was after years of study, proficiency in scholarship. But as the spires of, um, of Babylon began to spread across the land, the work became more and more difficult. The papacy captured the hearts of more and more of the great kings who desired power and wealth with the result of destroying their heritage of the Wallenseys and spreading lies and rumors. This is the history that we get today. In the book Occult Theocracy, looking up the Albigenses, which were destroyed in the, in the 15th century, a million were destroyed at one time. It says, as to the Albigenses, their name derived from Albi, a town of Languedoc, covered not one but many sects issued from Manichaeanism and Arianism. That's a total lie. And yet the scholars today believe that and counted also many Jews and Judaized Christians. Why do they say that? These weren't Jews. They were French people. They kept the Sabbath. They were Seventh-day Adventists. Another book, Secret Societies of All Ages by Hecathorn, a renowned scholar. He says again, the Albigenses, one of the most extensive and active heresies was that of the Albigenses, so-called after the chief town of Albi, whence they spread all over southern France. The sect was the offspring of Manichaeism. No, Manichaeism was in Persian Gnosticism. It was one of the foundations of Roman Catholicism. It was a dirty word in those days. And yet, the Catholic Church spread these rumors and wrote these things in the records of the Inquisition, forcing terrible confessions out of people through pain. Various isolated rebellions revealed the general spirit and wholesale slaughter had not repressed it. The rationalism of the Waldensee, so-called after Peter Waldo, the founder of the sect, connected itself with the German mysticism of the Rhine. That's witchcraft of the Teutonic tribes. No, never. And then the Netherlands, where the operates rose against the counts, they never rose against their, their political rulers. They were always cooperative. But pictures of the Waldenseys were spread throughout the world as, as, and told that these people uh, performed witchcraft rites at night in their churches. They offered babies and human sacrifice. And the world revulsed at this, began to do the work of terrible destruction. We have no idea how many human beings in Europe were destroyed that were Seventh-day Adventists. Conservative uh, figures range up to 200 million people by the time the, uh, the Inquisition was over with. We don't know what it was. Official record is 50 to 68 million people. But we know one thing, that those people cannot die for nothing. And everyone, anyone here that does not take up this faith with a strength that God is so willing to give and go forward as these people did is not worthy of the heritage that these people gave us. The papacy came into those valleys in some of the most horrible scenes of destruction. As these people fled into the mountains and there... They counted an honor to suffer for Jesus Christ. I visited one cave while I was there. In that cave, 400 people met there for church. One picture in the uh, museum there in Torre Pelice shows a cave. A papal man at the beginning of the cave is pointing out the different Waldenses. They're taking the pastor by the ruff of the neck. One of the women is being grabbed by a soldier while her child tries to protect her and a little baby is being pulled away from her mom. It gives you some view. Another painting there in the museum shows the suffering of these people as they wandered without food in the mountains. In the 17th century when Pianza's troop came through, they told the Wallensees they were just trying to find some, uh, 
some criminals that, uh, that had established themselves in the valleys, and the people said, well, we'll help you, of course. And so they opened up their house to them, and then the order came through for these soldiers to kill. They raped, destroyed the women who had just served them, and a terrible slaughter took place. 1655, these people were almost destroyed. But there was a hero at that time that rose up. His name was Giannavelli, or, or Giannavello. Giannavello, we have record of a letter that he answered from Pianza. And this is how Pianza told him that I have your family, I've captured them, and we're going to torture them to death unless you give yourself up. We'll burn them to death. And this was Giannavello's answer. Remember, this man's a Seventh-day Adventist. There are no torments so terrible, no death so barbarous that I would not choose rather than deny my Savior. Your threats cannot cause me to renounce my faith, they but fortify me in it. Should the Marquise de Pianza cause my wife and daughters to pass through fire, it cannot but consume their mortal bodies. Their souls I commend to God, trusting that he will have mercy on them and on mine, should it, be, should it please him that I fall into the Marquis's hands. Do we have that kind of character today? Can we handle that kind of challenge today? These questions need to come through us. During the uh, Contineos attack on these people, they made their way up to the Valley Angragna, over the mountains into a narrow path at the head of the Valley of Bobbio. And there they made their way up through a crevice in the mountains. And as they came out into this open area, with the army of 700 men following behind them, a couple of young men mounted up way up high on the mountain overhead and began to drop chunks of stone. But not before they had prayed and asked God to deliver them. And a great cloud, a cloud the size of man's hand, formed. And then the cloud turned into an inky black mist that went down. And 700 men were destroyed. One man was saved alive who went back to tell the story what had happened. But this valley, Wiley says, is a goodly valley that a whole nation could go into. And it is. As I walked through that valley and heard the quiet, the breeze, and the tinkling of the sheep bells, it just brought me back a thousand years in time to a greater time when God's church covered the whole earth. And men and women went to church on Sabbath almost in every country you went, but Rome and, and Alexandria, Egypt. There were little towns there. They're empty now. They're used by the shepherds during certain times of the year. But my imagination is keen. And to me, I was reliving a past and felt that I was part of something much bigger than I am now. But the scenes can be seen in the museum there of the sufferings of these people, beyond our wildest dreams or imagination, to watch their families destroyed before their eyes. And the instruments of torture leave you weak, but in Christ we can bear up anything. Count it an honor to suffer for Him. <clears throat> this... Um, mountain over on the right side of the picture is called Costaluzzo. It is an emblem of the suffering of these people. In one of the raids on their valleys, the, uh, the papal soldiers dragged these people up there. Women and children were thrown down the sides of the rocks. <clears throat> this encouraged uh, the Protestant leaders in England to to include him in Milton's paradise, include the record of these peoples in Milton's paradise lost. And I'd like to read just that little part of it there. It says, Avenge, O Lord, thy slaughtered saints whose bones lie scattered on the alpine mountains cold. Even them who kept thy truth so pure of old when all our fathers worshiped stocks and stones. Forget not. In thy book record their groans who were the sheep and in their ancient folds slain by the bloody Piedmontese that rolled mother with infant down the rocks. Their groans, the veils redounded to the hills and they to heaven. Their martyred blood and ash, so o'er all the Italian fields where still does sway the triple tyrant. That from these may grow a hundredfold who have learned thy way. Early may fly the Babylonian foe. These people respected the church of the wilderness even though they didn't keep the Sabbath. The armies continued to come into the valley, and between the years 1655 and 1680, the people were almost destroyed. During that last assault upon them in 1686, 14,000 people were brought into the dungeons. Their hills destroyed, their valleys laid waste, and here, 14,000 people languished in a filthy Italian jail. Their mothers and children 
When they crawled out of that two years later, at the insistence of the Protestant governments, only 3,000 skeletons came out. And these were forced by the papal soldiers to walk over the Alps in the dead of winter at the time of a storm. Now I want to show you what those Alps look like during the warm months of the year. As I tried to walk through it and lost the path and stumbled along, and there was a frozen stream and a frozen waterfall, I couldn't find my way, and I think it was God's mercy that got me out of that. I have no sense of direction as a human being. The mountain goats followed me. That was the only sound I heard was their noises as they followed on the rocks. But after that terrible winter, as the snow melted, the dead and decaying bodies of these dear folks, Seventh-day Adventists, were to be seen. The reformers acknowledged the church in the wilderness as the most ancient. And in 1530, representatives were sent to Geneva. Now, that was a dangerous time for the church. I'm going to go back up to where we were in, in 1680s. Some men separated from their homelands determined to go back into it. 1688, they began their return, called the Glorious Return. 900 men held 10,000 Roman troops off. The head was a, a, a pastor by the name of Arnaud, Henry Arnaud. He had a Bible in his belt while a sword was in his other hand. By the mercies of God, they were delivered, and now... This church has made its way back through its valleys. During those years, they made their way back to the place that they loved so much. They built their churches again, raised up their homes, began to plant their gardens, and eventually they built a church all the way down near the Vatican. There it is there, right around the corner from, from the Pope. You can't stop a Seventh-day Adventist. <clears throat> Unfortunately, in 1630, there was a terrible plague that came through, and all the pastors were killed in that terrible plague. French Swiss reformers came in and took over the Waldensee Church, and at that time they lost the Sabbath and many of the other primitive beliefs. But they had laid the foundation for this much earlier, and I'll tell you about that as soon as I get done showing you this. These are their, uh, their shows how the Waldenses live. All of these things are handmade, but every convenience that a person should need is the industry of these people living totally off the land, lived a high level of civilization. Their fields and their gardens were the best kept in all of Europe, and, and noblemen and princes invited these people to colonize in other areas because of their gifts in agriculture, the ABCs of education. Even in winter, they weren't quiet. There they were busy working, sewing their clothes, making the implements, and even toys and things for the children. I look at these pictures, and it makes me homesick, but I've never been their home. Making their bread, putting it up for the winter, making their olive de, ole de olive, their olive oil, cows right there in the house with them to keep everybody warm. Even the old timers, 60, 70 years old, out working, growing their little bit of food and very happy for the little acre that God has given. Look at the terraced mountainsides. Think of the work that went into to making gardens out of the sides of those mountains. This is one of the staple foods there, chestnuts that grow wild and gather them from the area. The children live and grow in a society where they have to work. And as they grow up, they could go anywhere in the world and start a home right off the land. But the old Waldensian society is gone today. It's only a memory. There are those who live in the valley, but they're largely Roman Catholic now. And old books are being done away, and new books of a new order are coming in. This, I believe, written by a Jesuit, though it's the head pastor of the Waldensian Church in the valleys, named Georgia Thorne. This book's been published in several languages throughout the world, but it teaches that the Waldenses began at Waldo, and their original group rejoined the Catholic Church. The problem with them was this, that in 1530, they went over to the Reformation, and they studied together. Although the Reformation acknowledged them as an older church at Shanfran two years later, 
These Adventists gave up tenets of their faith to join the Reformation. They compromised with the evangelicals, and it laid a path that destroyed them as a people. And we have that example to look at today. The Waldenses had to choose to become part of the Reformation, says this Jesuit. The decision at Shanfran to give up a pursuit of their independent course, opting for new life in the framework of a wider Protestant movement, was for that generation a difficult but very clear choice. It's not true. They joined a mass of, of disagreements when they joined the uh, Protestant world who all fought. Everybody was trying to get their own converts. It was no longer the church in the wilderness at that time, but it was the mess of the Reformation, even though God used that to begin to turn eyes away from Rome. The sad part of it is, is that the Waldensee history would have been totally lost if it hadn't been for Brother Gilles, Gilly and others, Jilly and others who came from Britain and other parts of Europe to study the Waldensian history and give them back their culture. Will it have to be people of the world that raise up the Adventist message? It's a sad situation, isn't it? But history does repeat itself, little Catholic churches. These people claim to support the ecumenical movement. They think now Pope Paul is a wonderful man doing a tremendous work. Will we be doing the same thing? Will we maybe one day give another gold medallion to the Pope? But here we see the church, symbol of the one who has a right to destroy kings, queens, and heretics. Today we have compromised, and we've laid a plan out for the enemy to, to guide us in that would destroy us if we don't rise up as individuals and take personal responsibility. Walking into one of the old little houses there, I sat down and looked down and just imagined what it was like to be part of that church. And then seeing a cave through the mountains, I walked in and I crawled in and just thought what it would be like to be there with my little family waiting for the destruction of the armies, counting it a privilege to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ. Where are the, our nods today? Where are the Waldenses today? Where is the church in the wilderness today? It's going to rise out of the word of God for those who will study. In Washington, D.C., at the Court of Justice, you look up and you see these two figures, liberty and justice, sitting there. The Ten Commandments between them, the sun rising overhead, and the Sabbath covered by one knee. A portent for things to come, an ominous sign. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. The entire Christian world is going to be destroyed soon. The uncircumcised will destroy the circumcised, the pattern of history. The apostate uh, church will be destroyed very, very soon. And this is the history of the Western Hemisphere. You and I have to lay careful plans for our future, for the future of our children. If we've missed so far what we're supposed to do and realizing the graveness of the situation, then it's about time that we drop on our knees before the God and agonize. Cry between the porch and the altar and ask God to protect his people. Give us some more time, Lord. It's almost over and my children aren't ready for heaven. God wants to invite us home. Let's bow our heads, shall we? Let's kneel together. Dear Father in heaven, as we come before thee on this sacred and holy Sabbath day, a day that's been handed to us by the blood of many martyrs, as we open our Bibles today and we look at it and we realize that sacred text that you have preserved through us, through your people, oh God in heaven, please give us the presence of mind to realize who we are, what we are, and the privilege that we have at this time in history. Let no man, no organization stand between us and our destiny now. I pray that you'll move on the hearts of these dear souls here who've come so far that a conviction could start today, Lord, that would make them ready for that kingdom that's soon to come. Lord in heaven, help us to see the big picture that we are the church of the apostles, and it's time for the apostles to finish the work. These things I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.